Hi, this is Margaret Flowers, and um, we just finished listening to President Donald Trump give an address to Congress where he spoke about a number of issues, and one of the issues, of course, that he spoke about was health care. And so I thought that people uh, might want some clarification on, you know, what's going to be happening next under a Trump administration, and what can we expect when it comes to health care, and what can we do about that. So I'm going to speak for a few minutes about some of the things that Trump talked about, and I really urge you to ask questions or make comments uh, in this post, and also to invite other people okay. that you know uh, to watch this, you know, spread it out, share it on your personal page and other pages, so that we can have a little bit of a conversation about healthcare in the United States. And I'm just going to keep my reading glasses on so that I can uh, read your comments if you submit them. So first off, let's start out by talking a little bit about what uh, President Trump said tonight. Of course, he reaffirmed his intention to repeal and replace the Affordable Care Act. He acknowledged that it's in trouble, and the reality is, is that it has been failing uh, over the last few years. It has been failing to solve the, the crisis in health care, mm -hmm. and of course, we expected that that was what was going to happen because it was never designed to be a truly universal or affordable plan. So um, right before the November elections, people received their insurance premium renewal notices, and for many of them, they saw significant increases in the cost of their insurance premiums as well as in the cost of their copays and deductibles that they have to pay out of pocket before they can even get the care that they need or have their insurance kick in. So that may have had something to do with the uh, outcome of the presidential election this year, just getting those, those notices. So, you know, we have to do something. Now, what is the Trump administration talking about? Sadly, um, I don't think that when he says what his goals are, that he's going to be able to meet those goals with the types of policies that he's talking about putting forward. So in terms of insurance, he says that he doesn't support the individual mandate to purchase private insurance. Now, I don't personally support the individual mandate either because it's not at the type of situation where we have a big pool, you know, insurance pool and people buy in and then it's there to cover everybody. We have, you know, 1,200 different pools. And so um, having forcing people to buy into these is not going to, um, you know, give the kind of savings that we need so that we can cover health care. We have to remember that private health insurance in the United States is a financial instrument that's legally required to produce profit for their investors. They do that by charging high premiums, shifting more of the cost over to individual patients, and then de denying or restricting care. So they were never actually designed to pay for health care in the first place. Um, so lowering the cost of insurance um, is, is another priority that President Trump has. And he talks about, and I'm going to get to that. Thank you, Ryan. Right. Um, he's talking about allowing the sale of private health insurance across state lines. So what does this actually mean? Different states have different regulations requiring health insurers to cover certain things and, um, you know, and they kind of make their relationships with the different facilities uh, in, in, the, in the states. And so allowing insurers to sell across state lines basically means that insurance companies are going to incorporate in the states that have the fewest regulations create insurance products that may you know, not be very expensive, but at the same time, they're not going to be covering as much as you know, private insurance covers now, even though it's still not um, adequate for our, our needs. So it really would just drive a race to the bottom in terms of the quality of private health insurance plans, deregulate them, and allow people to buy very cheap but very skimpy plans that won't, won't protect them. Um, he did talk about uh, making sure that insurance companies cover pre-existing conditions, but the way that they're going to do that is by charging higher premiums. And we've seen this happen before, and it really means that people who have significant health problems uh, continue to struggle to be able to afford the health insurance that they need, especially if those conditions make it difficult for people, people to be able to work and have insurance through their employers. So, um, so you know, covering pre-existing conditions is great. He hasn't really outlined any plan for how he's going to be able to do that in a way that is also affordable. Um, he has support for um, tax credits 
and health savings accounts as ways to help people buy their uh, insurance, their private insurance, to be able to afford it. Let's look at tax credits. That's been tried at the state level before. And tax credits mean that people um, have money up front to pay for the private health insurance and then will get a ta you know, tax credit when tax time comes around. And we're in an economic situation in this country where so many people are struggling uh, to make ends meet our living paycheck to paycheck. And so a tax credit does not help that part of the uh, population. And I'm going to talk about Medicaid in just a moment, um, Bill, thanks. Um, the other thing, the health savings accounts are a financial instrument that the wealthy can use to put money into a, a health savings account and then it's uh, tax free for them. And they're allowed to use that money to cover the cost of their premiums as well as to purchase uh, health care services, medications, and even gym memberships. So again, this is something that helps the wealthy, but t health savings accounts don't work when two thirds of people in the United States don't have enough money on hand to handle a $500 um, emergency. Uh, he did talk about Medicaid. He talked about giving states flexibility. So i um, not really sure exactly what the details of that are going to be, but if it's consistent with what he has been saying or what's been coming out of the White House, what the Republicans in Congress have been talking about, it's about giving each state a lump sum of money for their Medicaid, and then the governors of those states can decide how they use that money. Now, this is very concerning for a number of reasons. One is that, um, at least for now, Medicaid has been what we call defined benefit plans. So each state determines what they're going to cover and what people need to, you know, what conditions make them qualify. Right now, it's a uh, income below 138% of federal poverty level. And then however much money it costs to cover the number of people that qualify, to cover the benefits that they are given, that's how much money the state and the federal government pay into the Medicaid system. Once you have a block grant, a set amount of money, that means that if more people need care, you have to cut back on the services. And so, and it also, you know, means that governors, when they're, when they're given this flexibility, um, which we've already seen under the Obama administration because the Department of Health and Human Services has been giving out waivers to various states for their Medicaid plans. We're seeing that it, particularly in very conservative states, um, they're charging co-pays up front so that patients who are on Medicaid have to pay out of pocket before they can get care. And this is a population that doesn't have that, um, you know, that money on hand, that discretionary income. And so it's actually causing people to not be able to get the care they need. We're seeing states that want to move to um, requiring people who qualify for Medicaid to purchase insurance on the in insurance exchanges with some support for that. And again, this throws uh, people, makes them vulnerable, throws them into a situation where they can only get the insurance that they can afford. And most of the time, it's, it's low coverage and very high out-of-pocket um, costs. So um, this is not the direction that we want to see Medicaid going. He talked about um, decreasing the price of pharmaceuticals. I think that that's really important because in the United States, we pay the highest prices for our medications. And there's no rhyme or reason to why we pay the prices that we pay you know, compared to other countries. It's really because we have a market-based system where pharmaceutical companies have been, you know, acquiring other companies uh, so that they become, a, they develop a monopoly over certain medications, and then they can charge as much as they can get away with for those medications. And so it'll be interesting to see uh, what President Trump thinks that he can do to get, you know, get the, the cost of pharmaceuticals under control. But in general, looking at, you know, where things are going under the Republicans and under the Trump administration, what we're going to see is a greater privatization of our health care system, um, you know, more people who may be able to purchase insurance, but it will cover less and leave them vulnerable. We're continuing to see um, Lots of people that go bankrupt uh, develop, you know, personal bankruptcies because of medical costs. That has not changed, and um, and so someone has a question: supply and demand. I'm I'm wondering maybe you can expand a little bit more on on what that uh, question is. Um, but we have to remember that in this country, 
Um, having health insurance is not the same thing as having ex access to care or having what we call health security. Health security means that when you get sick, you know that you can get the care that you need without having to worry if you have the money up front, without having to worry about going bankrupt, um, or not being able to pay for food or other things that you need, um, not having to worry about you know losing your house if you have to have very expensive treatment. And this happens here in the United States. It doesn't happen in any of the other industrialized nations. So um, what I advocate and many others advocate for in the United States is moving to a national improved Medicare for all. So basically what that means is building on our traditional Medicare that we've had in this country since 1965. It means that each person pays into the system through a uh, progressive tax up front. It gets rid of the private insurance companies. You're absolutely right. Private insurance companies should not be practicing medicine in the United States, and that's what they do. They tell doctors and patients, you know, what they can and cannot have. So we would have a, we're advocating for a national improved Medicare for all, paid up front through progressive taxes. Every single person living in the United States is in the system. All of the health professionals are in the system, and when someone needs to get care, they decide where they want to get care. It's not an insurance company network, you know, telling them where they can and cannot go. It's really uh, patients can choose where they want to go. So if there's a center, you know, a hospital near you that is specializing, you know, specializing in a particular condition that you have, that's where you can go to get the care. It gives us the most freedom. One of the reasons that I fight so hard for this solution is that we're already paying for it in the United States. We're spending twice as much per person per year on health care as most other industrialized nations. Those nations cover everybody and they have much better health outcomes and satisfaction rates than we do. And that's because they have some type of a universal publicly financed health care system. And so if we're already spending enough money to provide high quality comprehensive coverage to everyone, why are we continuing with this system of private insurance where they're really just, the private insurers are, are trying to make as much money as they can, suck as much money out of the system as they can. The pharmaceutical companies are trying to suck as much money out of the system as they can. We're seeing you know, private investor-owned health facilities and hospitals that are really just operating on a for-profit model, not really about the, the health of our patients. Um, why are we allowing this situation to continue? And the reality is that even though, you know, when single payer is, is talked about, when it rarely is talked about in the commercial media, you know, or National Improved Medicare for All and single payer are the same thing. When they're talked about in the commercial media, overwhelmingly they're talked about in a negative way. But despite that, we still have super majorities of people in the United States that support this approach. Overall, across the board, 60 or more percent of people in the United States want a national improved Medicare for all. Republicans are growing in their support for believing that the government should make sure everybody has access to care. For, for Republicans that make under $75,000 a year, there was a 20% increase over the last year in how many of them support this approach. When it comes to Democratic voters, 80% of Democratic voters want to see this approach. But it's off the table. It's been off the table under a Democratic uh, administration, and of course it's on, off the table under a Republican administration. It's really um, because these industries that are profiting off of our system are the same industries that fund the campaigns of our elected officials. So what do we do? It's up to us to put National Improved Medicare for All on the table, and we can do it. Uh, the people have the power to do this. You know, when we fought in 2014 to reclassify the Internet, we went up against the giant telecom industries. They're some of the biggest lobbyists in Washington, D.C., and we won. We were persistent in that fight, and we won reclassification of the Internet. We have to continue to protect it, but we, we did win that and establish that into law. Um, when multinational corporations were working behind closed doors with the Obama administration, to negotiate treaties that would give them greater powers to uh, exploit our communities, to drive down wages, to offshore their facilities. 
people of the United States worked together and we fought back and made that politically toxic. We made the Trans-Pacific Partnership so politically toxic that members of Congress ran away from it. So now our job is to unify again around national improved Medicare for all and make it so popular that members of Congress have to support that if they want to get reelected. We have legislation in the House of Representatives. It was introduced in January. It's called H.R. 676, the Expanded and Improved Medicare for All Act. It was introduced by Congressman John Conyers, and it has 59 co-sponsors so far. We need to have that same legislation introduced in the Senate so that we have what are called companion bills in the House and the Senate. This means that if we pass them in the House and Senate, and they're the same bill, that the, it gives the Congress, it, it removes the ability of leadership in Congress to then weaken those bills. So we're asking Senator Sanders to introduce legislation in the Senate that is the same as H.R. 676 in the House. He started out uh, last fall after the election saying that he was not going to introduce any single-payer legislation this year. And he said that because they the Democrats are really going into just a purely defensive mode and really just want to obstruct everything the Republicans do. And um, that's not okay. We need to be fighting right now for the things that we need. We're not going to let the Democrats obstruct for four years and then if they get in power four years from now, then just make all sorts of excuses for why they can't do the things that, that we need them to do then. We have to fight now for it. So. Please call Senator Sanders and uh, contact his office and ask him to introduce a companion bill to H.R. 676. Then we have to educate ourselves about what National Improved Medicare for All is. And we're organizing national calls. We hold them every other Monday night at 9 p.m. Eastern. And the next call is going to be March 13th. And on those calls, we educate about different aspects of what National Improved Medicare for All are we educate about how to organize, how to reach members of Congress, how to pressure them, how to do actions, and we'll be doing that ongoing. So you can go to healthoverprofit.org and sign up uh, for the campaign. That will put you on our email list and we'll let you know about those calls and also let you know about actions that you can take. If you go to the news section of that website, you'll find at the very top uh, information about the national calls that we're holding. You'll also find an action page. And if you go to the action page, you'll find actions that you can take. Right now we're organizing towards, um, we just finished organizing around the town halls. And uh, those were really amazing. They were, many of them were supposed to be focused on preserving the Affordable Care Act, but it came out at so many of them, many of our people involved in the campaign who went to the town halls reported back that, that people said, you know, everywhere they went, what we really want is a national improved Medicare for all. So that's a really great sign for us. Now we're organizing to be part of an international day of action against the privatization of health. It's called Our Health is Not for Sale, and people are organizing all sorts of actions from teach-ins uh, to marches to rallies, and so we're providing tools for people to do that. Um, one of the tools that we have that we're kind of organizing around is a... Uh, a diagnosis. It's, it's, we're calling it an epidemic in the United States that is surprisingly stops at our borders with Mexico and Canada, which mm -hmm. have universal health care systems. And it's called PISD, Privatization Induced Stress Disorder. It sounds a little bit like PTSD. And, um, and it's what's happening in, in, because we have this privatized healthcare system. And so we're developing you know, uh, messaging and tools around that that people can use to hand out and, and let's talk about this, let's talk about what the impact is of being the only industrialized nation in the world that treats healthcare as a commodity instead of treating it as a public, something that's in the public interest that every person should have access to. So um, for those of you who may have just joined in a nutshell, uh, it looks like you know more and more the Republicans are moving towards wanting to repeal the Affordable Care Act. Um, even if they didn't repeal it, we know that it, it didn't solve the health care crisis in this country. Um, so we have this opportunity right now to push forward and advocate for what we want and for what we need. And if we do that, if we work together and understand that health care impacts all of us, that it, it's connected to all of our issues um, and we work together, 
then we can win this fight. This is really the time to do this. And so contact your member of Congress, find out if they've sponsored HR 676. If they haven't, you need to pressure them to do that. If they have, say, great, now I need you to do more. I need you to talk about it. I need you to write up about it in your paper. I need you to get your other colleagues in your state to get on board, hold town halls about it, let people speak out, educate them about it. Um, you know, there's so much that members of Congress need to be doing beyond just co-sponsoring legislation. Push on your members in the Senate, particularly everyone can call Senator Sanders and ask him to introduce H.R. 676 in the Senate and then work on your members of the Senate uh, to support this approach. Maybe one of them would be interested if they would, you know, maybe they're seeking re-election and they're, maybe their re-election is a little shaky. This is a way for them to really... Uh, to do something that their constituents want and need. Um, maybe you would consider running for office on this platform in 2018 for Congress or if the Senate race is open, uh, running for Congress on this issue and educating people and, and pressuring the other candidates to, to speak out and to learn and support this issue. What's um, H.R. 676 and how do you pay for it? What is H.R. 676? How do we pay for it? So H.R. 676 is a bill in the House of Representatives. It's called the Expanded and Improved Medicare for All Act. Um, if you go to thomas.loc, stands for Library of Congress, .gov, Thomas loc.gov and type in HR 676. You'll be able to read the text of the bill. It's very easily readable. You can see who's co-sponsored it. It would create a national improved Medicare for all where everybody's in the system. It's paid up for up front, up front through taxes and it's comprehensive. It includes uh, mental health care, uh, vision, dental, hearing, long-term care, rehabilitation, uh, substance abuse care, um, inpatient, outpatient, uh, emergency care, medications, medical devices, all of the things that we need because when everyone's in the system and it's comprehensive, that creates the simplest administration. Right now, we're wasting a third of our health care dollars just on paperwork. If we move to a national improved Medicare for all, it's estimated that will free up over $500 billion a year uh, that's not necessary towards the administration and can go to pay for care. Um, we, the HR 676 says that there should be no copays and no deductibles. You just pay for it up front through a progressive tax. So employees would be paying, I think I have to double check the numbers, but it's I think it's 3% tax for employees and a 6% tax for employers. And then on top of that, there are some taxes on uh, unearned income or wealth and, and progressive taxes for those who are wealthy that will help to pay into it. We're currently spending uh, more in public dollars in the United States per person per year than other nations are spending. And again, they cover everybody and they have better health outcomes. So even if we just use the public dollars that we had right now, we could provide a, a high quality health care system. It has some very significant savings. So one saving I mentioned is the administrative savings. And not only does that save money, but it saves headaches. Like uh, patients struggle to figure out where they can go for care and then once they go you know what kind of care can they get can they afford uh, the medication that they need people don't need to have this this these headaches about getting care these stresses it's hard for health professionals because we have to figure out with each different plan if our patient needs to see a specialist or get a certain test or get a certain medi medication is it covered where can they go? We waste so much time on, on just these efforts that are really just designed for private insurers to be able to not pay for care. So administrative simplicity saves money and it makes it easier for all of us. We also save money because now we have a system that can negotiate for fair prices for pharmaceuticals and also for health services. Health professionals are still going to be paid just fine in this country. We're just really overpaying for many of our, our health care services. And then it allows us to give hospitals and other health facilities what are called uh, global operating budgets. So every month they get a check. They use that to pay for the care for people in their community. And then, and then if they need something extra, like a, a particular piece of technology or a new building for a new facility, 
that's determined by the system based on, you know, is it really needed or does the hospital across the street already have that? We don't need to, to duplicate that. We could use that money to put that facility in another area that doesn't have access to that. So it really allows us to actually do health planning. So single payer saves money for us. It saves money for the system. It controls the health care costs. It's just, it's a win all the way around. What is the strategy to win? The strategy to win, um, I was saying earlier, is really to make this the only politically feasible uh, solution to our health care crisis. We do that by educating ourselves, organizing in our communities, and then putting pressure on our members of Congress, and really uh, being willing to escalate that pressure in whatever ways are necessary. When we were fighting around the Trans-Pacific Partnership, um, you know, we there were a lot of great creative direct actions that people did to put pressure on members of Congress um, so that they wouldn't support the Trans-Pacific Partnership. We need to be willing to do those things again, going to their town halls and bird-dogging them, going wherever they go and pressuring them, going to their offices, bringing people in there to meet with them, meet with their staffers, and maybe even sit in and stay there if that's what we have to do. And if they don't support it, we shame them in the public media. We write letters to the editors and saying, why is congressperson so-and-so not supporting the plan that most people in this country support and that would save lives and save money? Um, what are the three types of health care in the United States currently that we have? Three types of health care in the United States. So we have a purely socialized system. That would be the Veterans Administration. Um, in general, when we look at that system, it's, it's one that's owned and operated by the government. Uh, it is the most efficient. Uh, doctors are generally happy in there. They're paid by salary. Uh, it has an, an independent institution that looks at treatments and medications in a, in a non-biased way and gives that information to its health professionals. It is under a lot of stress. Uh, we have been in, you know, in really endless war for the last decade plus, and, um, and it's not being funded adequately to meet the needs of our veterans. So um, it, it is the most efficient, but it is underfunded. Um, the second system is, is Medicare, traditional Medicare, which is paid up front through taxes, but then people can go to whatever health facility. So it could be a public hospital. It could also be a, a private facility, and that's, that's Medicare, and that's what we're advocating for uh, right now is a national improved Medicare for all, although a national health service like the UK is also a very um, efficient way to provide health care for everyone. And then the third system is our privatized health insurance system, and as I said earlier, we have to understand that private health insurance is a financial instrument. It's owned by investors. It has a financial obligation to make as much profit as possible for those investors. It does that by charging the highest premiums possible, shifting as much cost of care onto individuals through co-pays and deductibles, and then denying and restricting payment for care. Carol Paris asks, do you think the president will really go after the pharmaceutical lobby and reduce the cost of drugs? You know, that, that's a great question, Carol. I think that, um, you know, he's a businessman, he's a, he's a billionaire, and, uh, and, you know, the, the pharmaceutical industry is a very influential industry. Uh, in this country, so it, it remains to be seen whether he's really willing to take them on once he sees what that entails. Um, it's a great question. What makes you think we can win this? These are, these are you going against some of those powerful corporations in the country, like the pharmaceutical lobby, the insurance lobby, and the investors in for-profit health care. Why do you think you can win this? Right, so, so why do we think that we can win this? First off, this is what the majority of people in the United States want. So we have what's called a national consensus on this issue already. Um, it's an interesting time. You know, many of us have been advocating for this for a long time. And now we're really at a moment that is, to me, unprecedented, that I see individuals and groups who didn't tradu traditionally um, actively advocate for this are saying that this is a top priority. So that tells you that there's really uh, there's something about this time that, that people are really ready for this. I think when it comes to the health professional community, we're seeing a level of desperation amongst health professionals, which also is unprecedented because they really are on their knees to the insurance companies and pharmaceutical industries. Health professionals have no negotiating power with these entities, and so they're cutting reimbursements, they're, they're raising the prices of medications, health professionals are, see, are seeing the real suffering that is a result of this. Um, and I know that, you know, 
there's, we now have a hundred years of history of how social transformation occurs, of, of research looking at this. And what it basically tells us is that when you have 3.5% of the population mobilized on an issue and you have national consensus on that issue, you will win. So that's what, you know, 3.5% of the population is still a large number, but percentage wise, it doesn't mean that we have to get everybody fighting for this. We just need to get a good number of people that are activated. Some people, you know, some issue groups have won with less of the population, but no government has withstood 3.5% mobilization. So um, it's really, people have power. We just have to recognize that we have that power and use it. And you already saw, you know, when the Republicans at the beginning of this year were talking about repeal, and it was a real possibility that they could repeal the Affordable Care Act. Um, they shortly after that they held a uh, retreat in Philadelphia, and someone audio taped some of that retreat. And this was after constituents had been pushing back against uh, members of Congress over the repeal. And what was interesting is that they were saying secretly, "Whoa, what are we going to do? We can't take health care away from our constituents. You know, we can't defund Planned Parenthood. Our constituents won't like this." So. You know, even with just that little bit of pushback, had them freaking out. So we do have power when we use it. There are more of us than there are of them. And so if we come together, we can win this. How about the um, uh, any polls of doctors, nurses, any medical associations or nurses associations taking any positions on this? Sure, thank you. Um, so really interesting, um, in terms of of physicians. There have been two national polls. One was done in 2002 and one another one was done, it was repeated in 2007. And this was looking at physicians across the nation and across various specialties. They found um, in 2007 that 59 percent of physicians across the nation supported National Improved Medicare for All. What was striking is that this was a 10 percent increase in just a five-year period. And that if you looked at certain specialties, like pediatrics, family practice, psychiatry, emergency rooms, you had 70 and even into the 80s percent support for this. Um, so that was 10 years ago. I imagine just based on um, what we're experiencing and what we're hearing from people that are practicing, uh, that there'd be even more widespread support. Um, just, I think it was last week, the American College of Physicians, the Annals of Internal Medicine, uh, published a full call for a national improved Medicare for all or a single payer system. That was the first time in their 90 year history that they did that. And now uh, we also know that the American Academy of Pediatrics and the America American Academy of Family Physicians uh, have called for or passed resolutions to study uh, single payer as a solution to our healthcare crisis. So, uh, and then when it comes to nurses, uh, National Nurses United, the largest um, nurses union in the United States is also in support of this approach. So health professionals are behind this. Um, some people come on since you started. you want to do a quick recap of the uh, Trump uh, recommendations and your response? Sure, sure. So um, for those of you that have just come on, I, I was giving earlier a little bit of a feedback to what uh, President Trump said tonight about his proposals for health care, and it's, it's nothing really that was uh, very much of a surprise there. It's about um, deregulating health insurance, opening it up across state lines, which means that um, private insurers may be able to, to cut uh, charge less for health plans, but they will cover less and shift more of the cost on to people. Um, he doesn't like the individual mandate. I don't like that either. I don't think we should force people to buy a flawed project, uh, product, uh, but he wants to t take away the subsidies that exist to help people buy private health insurance and instead use tax credits, which do not work, and use health savings accounts, uh, which don't work for the majority of people in this country that, that can't actually save money up. So the, those health savings accounts are really meant for the wealthy. In terms of uh, Medicaid, moving states uh, to what's called block grants, so they only have a set amount of money to spend on Medicaid, that really uh, means that states are not going to be able to meet the needs of their Medicaid populations, especially in times of e economic difficulties when more people uh, need Medicaid. And then um, he said that he would include, you know, pre-existing conditions, but uh, that may not, you know, 
we've been here before where um, when we required pre-existing conditions but health insurers had the latitude to charge whatever they wanted and um, and people weren't able to afford, people who had pre-existing conditions weren't able to afford the plans. Um, and then he said he would try to control the cost of pharmaceuticals, but uh, it's really unclear what he thinks he's going to be able to do to uh, take on the pharmaceutical industry. We advocate for a national improved Medicare for all because it would solve all of these problems. It would uh, create a system that's paid up for upfront through taxes that everybody's included in, that is comprehensive, and that gives the system, the muscle that it needs to negotiate for fair prices for pharmaceuticals and for um, health services. And so we can, we can provide high quality health care for everybody and take away copays and deductibles which only serve as barriers to care. They mean that people have to make a financial decision when they need care instead of being able to just focus on, you know, where do they go for care, what do they need to do, what, you know, to get better. That's what it should be about. It should be about health as the bottom line, not profit as the bottom line. And that's why we're calling uh, our campaign Health Over Profit. It's uh, health over profit for everyone or healthoverprofit.org. And so if this is an issue that you care about, um, please visit that website, get involved, sign up, and get active. And what can people do to get active? What are some action steps they can take, should be taking now? Uh, so we have legislation in the House, H.R. 676, the Expanded and Improved Medicare for All Act was introduced in January. There are 59 co-sponsors. Uh, you can look and see if your member of Congress has co-sponsored it. It's H.R. 676, and you can go to thomas.loc.gov and uh, see the bill there, or you can also find links to that on Health Over Profit uh, for Everyone or healthoverprofit.org. So uh, get your member of Congress in the House to endorse that, and then call Senator Sanders' office. It's 202-224-5141, um, 202-224-5141. You can call right now and leave a message, or you can call in the morning and maybe speak to somebody. And our ask to Senator Sanders is that we want him to introduce a companion bill to H.R. 676 in the Senate so that if we have the same bill in the House and in the Senate, that gives us the strongest position to push them through and not allow leadership to weaken them. So contact your member of Congress. And as I was saying earlier, if your member of Congress is already on board, Pressure them to do more. Pressure them to speak out about it, educate about it, hold town halls, you know, write op-eds, get other members of their delegation on board. Every member of Congress can be doing something. Paul Tulak mm -hmm. asks, given the rising costs of health care and the increasingly reduction in employer-paid health care combined with the rising usage of emergency room health care services, how do, you th how do the people of the USA continue to think that their health care system is better with a for-profit system. Yeah, well, I think that we're seeing majorities of people in the United States that are saying that it's that it's not working, and our health care costs are really skyrocketing to levels that are unsustainable. You know, we're approaching 20% of our gross domestic product uh, being spent on health care, and most other nations spend 10% or less on, on their health care. And so um, and we're seeing it eating into family incomes where... The average cost of a premium for a family now is $17,000 a year. How do families afford that? I mean, employers help with, with that to some extent, but this is a huge burden on employers as well, and, and it, it causes employers to not be able to hire as many employees. It causes them to be less competitive, so there are some businesses that that you know provide health insurance for their employees, but then they have to compete with businesses in the same area that don't provide health insurance. It's a significant disadvantage and a significant burden for our small and medium-sized businesses, for our farmers who are really struggling um, you know, to, to survive right now, and they can't afford, many of them can't afford to buy health insurance. And so this is just, um, it's a huge drag on our economy in a lot of ways, even beyond the health care costs, just the lack of discretionary spending. So people are making choices between paying for their medicines and paying for other necessities that they, that they have, like food or clothing or rent. Um, and, and so we know that if we went to this type of a, of a program, National Improved Medicare for All, that not only would it help to solve our health care crisis, but it would also Im improve our economy from the bottom up. So it's a win-win uh, really all the way around. So we've had 3,000 views in the last 30 minutes, Great. about 164 shares. 
Um, but I think it's a good time to uh, wrap things up if you want to give people some final thoughts and, um, and we can close this off. Sure. Thanks, everybody, for, um, for tuning in tonight, for your concern about this really important issue. I just want you to, to understand that this is the time for us to push for a national improved Medicare for all. Um, the the health care system, you know, we've tried every tweak that there could be to fix our market-based system. It's not going to work. It's time for us to join the rest of the industrialized world and even some non-industrialized nations that, that provide health care for everybody, we can do it. So please go to healthoverprofit.org, sign up to get on the email list, check out our and register for the national calls that we're doing. Use the tools. There's tools for making media. There's tools for education, tools for action. Join our International Day of Action on April 7th. It's called Our Health is Not for Sale. And uh, let's get out there and, and just really talk to everyone you know about this and, and make sure that you contact your members of Congress. So um, if you ever have questions or need things, please reach out to me through my Facebook page or you can reach me at info at popularresistance.org, I-N-F-O at popularresistance.org. Thanks so much, everyone. Good night.